and welcome to the Open Paddock Rallycast. This is episode 51 for Tuesday, February 26, 2019. This week we welcome one of the few women drivers in rallying, Kiana Erickson Chang. She'll be here on the Rallycast where we chatted about what she enjoys most about racing and rallying specifically, her advocacy for STEM education and working with the Formula One in Schools program, the Gazelles Off-Road Navigation competition, competition, and her exciting international schedule for 2019. This is Open Paddock, the Rallycast. Welcome aboard. I'm your host, Mike Shaw, and with me is a man who needs a new snow shovel after shoveling 38 inches of snow. Holy crap, man. <laughs> Ian Holmes, who's been in the uh, snowdrifts of Minnesota. How you doing, Ian? Oh, I'm aching all over from shoveling all that snow. I will tell you that. Yeah, this is the uh, snowiest February on record in Minnesota. It's like one of the top five snowiest months that uh since records began it's been a heck of a month now oh is that, is that, here's a story to in, indicate what it's actually been like on sunday my wife and i were heading down to the uh the health club just down the road and uh, we got onto the main road and we actually got got behind a snow plow so we thought oh we'll be all right he'll clear the roads in front and so we got five or six miles down the road and the snow plow turned around and quit. There was the snow drift. The snow drift in the road was like it was past the axles, axles on our duke. So the, uh, there was that much snow there. The snow plow turned around and well. We called we, it a day, huh? It's like, we, nope, we can't called, do anymore. We called it a day. I mean, it's like, it was crazy. I mean, if the, if the WRC wants another a winter rally, I mean, pff, they can come to Minnesota for heaven's sake. It was, it's been something else this month that really has. Yeah, well, I'm sure if you had the spikes in their cars uh, <laughs> and their suspension, maybe you could have gotten through. I don't know. Yeah, we probably could. Yeah, that would have been that. But uh, they don't allow, they don't allow studs here in Minnesota. So. Nah. In yeah. most cases, they're not necessary anymore these days. The yeah. studless tires work actually better in some cases. So <laughs> that said, um, well, I'm really excited because our guest that we're going to have on here in just a second is very familiar with driving with uh, with or without studs on the ice and snow, and that is Kiana Erickson Chang. Uh, she's such a, a wonderful person, and she's been expanding the different horizons of what she does. Yeah, I found this really cool quote on her website you know i was very indifferent towards anything car related before getting my license i have more interest now but i'm not an auto aficionado my passion is driving oh oh i mean i want i want to know more about the passion without further ado let's welcome our guest kiana erickson chang as I said in our intro, we have with us Kiana Erickson Chang. Uh, she's been driving in, in two wheel drive for a long time now and, and getting faster and faster. Uh, happy to have you on the show. Kiana, how are you doing this evening? Doing well. A little bit tired, but. <laughs> well, it is East Coast time over been... there, yeah. And here I am yeah. on the Pacific Coast. It always makes these calls a little bit challenging. Sorry about that. Yeah. I've also just been away from home for a couple weeks, so just getting, getting back into the swing of things. Well, we are excited. Saw you on the entry list, of course, for 100 Acre Wood. But I want to kind of rewind things back a little bit because, you know, you have been rallying for a few years now. But I kind of want to know how it all started because, you know, I, I look at some of the stuff on your uh, on your background and what you in your about on your Facebook page and all that stuff. Done a little bit of ice driving, a little bit of other stuff here and there. What inspired you to get into race driving in general? Right, so my first introduction to performance driving was actually at the age of 16, and I'd been driving on the road for about a year and passed my driver's test in one of the worst snowstorms that we had in Vermont that year, but I really didn't care very much about cars or driving, um, and my dad actually made me go out to do a winter driving school to be safer on the roads. And smart dad, smart dad. Mm -hmm. I, I really wasn't the biggest fan of that first event, but... I decided that I could use to go back and actually continue the learning process. And once I started um, really getting stuff down, I started having fun. 
So I did those driving schools for a couple of years before deciding to actually give wheel-to-wheel ice racing a try. I, I wound up doing a couple seasons of the ice racing. Uh, first year I was actually Rookie of the Year with our organization uh, called AMEC, which is actually the oldest ice racing organization in the country. And then I was racing in the street legal, non-studded four-wheel drive class and had the most class wins of the year driving there. Um, but I was actually wound up being T-boned during a race by an older gentleman from Texas who just had this praxis of going full out down the straights and blowing turn one. And what wound up always stopping him was some other competitor's passenger door. Oh, so using the, pass- <laughs> the, the other competitor to help through the turn. Yeah, the one that's already like fully committed sideways, just you'd use that to stop him. So once we had this like big dent in the side of my car, which was an Audi 90, uh, we decided to actually go out and do the 24 hours of lemons. And it only lasted a couple of events. We did two events in 2014, and we had five Audi 90s, full race car builds, 25 drivers, and I was managing the whole thing and also trying to be a driver myself. You were managing a whole team of cars? Wow, that's ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, impressed. I wasn't having that much fun with it, especially because it would be every time I'd get back to go spot, we'd have another car coming in with a new penalty, and then, of course, it's lemon, so we have to, like, drill a cone in the hole, in the roof, or, you know, carve a pumpkin, and... <laughs> I'm going to say, <laughs> lemons is, is the funniest penalties yeah. I've ever seen in my life. I went up to an event up in Washington once, and it was just hilarious. And the cars themselves, the names oh, yeah. and the liveries... Uh, I, I got to ask, what was your car? So, well, our actual our whole team was called G-Tron uh, because obviously they're old Audis and not electric at all, gas powered. But it was also meant to be a little bit um, of a double joke because the theme was meant to take on a Tron theme, but the whole Tron aspect never happened. So, but it still worked. G-Tron still worked. <laughs> I would have loved like neon blue and yellow, you know, with, you know, (laughs) big arches painted on it to make it look like those cycles. We did have like a blue one that we called the Smurf, but (laughs) (laughs) nice (laughs) that aside. And then we had, I don't know, heat miser. And we had one that we called the rock box because it just was really janky. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds like a lemon scar. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But anyways, so the lemon stuff didn't last too long Um, at the end of the year a new series northeastern base called American Endurance Racing popped up at our home track which is Lime Rock and it was just their third race ever their final event of their first season and they founded it on a race that you've brung approach but also no BS simple rule book and targeted towards those with racing licenses so it was kind of somewhere in between SCCA or some like club racing and also just being able to race whatever you have. Um, And then they're classed by the times that you run. And they actually came up with a really good system of being able to flush out um, when cars exceeded. Like if you were sandbagging, they would be able to tell. Um, If you started racing faster and your, your laps started getting too fast, you actually just get bumped during the race. So you actually lose out if you hold back and then make one couple laps that are too quick get bumped up because then you've wasted how much time in the races which are nine hours just going slow and now all of a sudden you find yourself in a higher class it actually their whole kind of bracketing approach really worked out you you mentioned this was at at lime rock lime rock it's like one of the few racetracks that i've that i've been been to while i've been living in america now i was struck with lime rock by it's so english in a way yeah you know, it's set in trees and woodland it, it reminded me of my home my home circuit cadwell park and uh and other places like brands hatch and stuff like that and it was i i loved that place yeah i've turned a lot of laps at lime rock and honestly it's still one of one of my favorite tracks out there it's definitely my favorite place to spectator race mm. and until a couple of years ago they didn't really have much of the major sports car racing going on there because of their paddock situation and just being able to fit everyone. But it's honestly one of the best places to see a race because you don't have all the grandstands. You can actually see half the track 
if not more at one time you yeah. can walk the whole thing and you can be like sat down on the hill underneath a tree or wherever you want to be so it's a really <laughs> great little place if you've never been to you've never been to lime rock mike but there's on on the hillside looking down over the over the start finish straight there is a big tree and we were there wife and i were there for the lime rock historics and it was like a baking hot sunshiny day <laughs> And all and the only place that anybody was sitting on the other side of the, the track was was in the shadow of this huge yeah. tree. And you watch everyone just move throughout That's the day it. like a few <laughs> feet at a time <laughs> just to stay in the shade of the tree. Uh, that's hilarious. You know, I, I know we were mostly about uh, rallying here, but uh, Lime Rock. Wow, that, that is a track that I've heard that people either love it or they hate it. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky little track, actually, for, for its size. And there's not very good straights to pass on. So you do have to be, like, very strategic about passing. Honestly, most of your passes have to be planned 50% of the track in advance. Okay, so you did, did this uh, stint of uh, doing some endurance stuff at Lime Rock and whatnot. When did rallying come into the picture then? So we actually ran for 2015 and 16, which was when I was already getting into rally, um, full seasons with this AER series and wound up back-to-back second-place finishes in their outright season championship both years. So even when I was starting to get into the rally, I was still managing that. Um, but basically during all of this, I'd done a couple of rally schools just for fun. I was actually looking at getting full time into the sports car racing and either going into Pirelli World Challenge or the Continental Tires Mm -hmm. series Mm -hmm. for 2016. But that summer in 2015, I'd already done one rally sprint, the Revival SCCA one at O'Neill, um, in a rental Fiesta and could come in third in the limited two-wheel drive class. And then we spontaneously decided to make the trip up to NEFR. And once I saw the rally in person, I was like, oh, no, this is what we need to be doing. All of the sports car racing plans got thrown out the window, and I was (laughs) competing in my my first full-on stage rally three months later. Wow. And, and, and the hook was set, wasn't it? Yeah, just seeing it. it. It brought me back to why I got into it all in the first place, which is that like low traction car control. Yeah. I actually miss the wheel to wheel aspect. That's been one of the hardest transitions for me because it's really hard to push without having those people around me. It took me at half of my first season to actually stop checking my mirrors honestly (laughs) we don't need to get you out on a dirt track oval do we (laughs) i don't think so (laughs) get her in a sprint car there you go yeah there we go (laughs) yeah but i mean that mental aspect of not having someone around you to actually know like know how everyone is doing in comparison has been pretty difficult you know you just have to drive your own race in the end of the day yeah, you got to just constantly push yourself instead of, uh, you know, I guess you can look at the stage times at the end, but you know, that's after it's done. It's like, oh, crap, on the next one, I really need to push or, or whatever, but it's not like <laughs> exactly. that, that reference, it's constantly there. Um, now, obviously, rallying, you've got to go all these different places around the country to compete. You also got to go do this thing called the gazelles uh, that we've heard about out in uh, Moroccan desert, is it? Yeah, so the Gazelles, it's a nine-day navigational rally raid. So rather than a typical rally raid, it doesn't matter um, your speed between the points, but rather your actual driving distance. So the scoring is all based on the crow fly distance and everything over that is like your kilometers above that are additional points in a sense. Um, And then any checkpoint that you miss counts as additional kilometers and there's no technology allowed the whole time they take your phones prior to the start they put them in a lock box and the mapping is done completely by hand on black and white maps they were originally created in the 1950s and then you get about 150 kilometers of driving a day so yeah it's quite a unique event Mm-hmm. So, so you must have done some extra training then, like special desert training to cope to cope with the conditions. Uh, yeah, well, we did some 
off-road training actually in the cat skills in New York um, initially just to work on the communication between in car and out of car driving over obstacles uh, that kind of thing and then I wound up going out and doing a little bit of extra sand driving in Moab about a month before we left but nothing really could prepare us for the kind of sand that we had in Morocco, but most of the rally wasn't on the dunes. Most of it was the other kinds of terrain and quite rocky, actually. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what's it like driving in, in the open desert rough, rather than following marked roads? I mean, like you say, you were using a, only a map and a compass to uh, navigate. I mean, is that, is that a stressful experience between you and, you and the co-driver? Well, you know... <laughs> Initially, when we decided to do this, it was so much about the experience, but we went out and on the first day had a pretty solid day. And so then we knew we could do well. And after that, I think every little roadblock that we hit was hitting us really hard because we knew that we could do it. But also the more that you feel lost, the more you start to second guess yourself, the more difficult it is to make a decision on the next move. And honestly, having all of those decisions was one of the hardest parts. Like, do you put in a few extra kilometers to try and give something a go? Or do you save your kilometers and really try and pinpoint on you, where you are before you do anything? It's a really big gamble. So, and it was, uh, it was Claudia, that, Claudia that was your uh, navigator, wasn't it? It was, yeah. We should give her a, a big shout out as well for, for getting you through that whole thing. Yeah, it was... <laughs> A massive bonding experience like the complete trip honestly well i can imagine uh, that was the team over hyphenated if i recall correctly it, it was yeah because <laughs> obviously i my last name and then claudia's and every time we were getting the score sheets back during our stage rallies together the last names would make it run into the times and they told us then we could only have one one person per team with a hyphenated last name. So that's where that name came from. They said we were banned from having two team members with the last names. But obviously on the car, Claudia always runs the Barbera part of her last name, which is her father. So, you know, that experience that you had out there, um, is it something you'd like to go back and do again? Is there other types of rally raids you're interested in? I would love to go back and do it again. Honestly, most of the days you don't, really want to be there but it's just such an amazing experience and yeah I would love to go back and do it but right now I'm focused on the stage rally stuff and so for mm -hmm. me my budget's going towards that but if I had the chance to go back and do the gazelles again I would definitely mm -hmm. yeah because there, there, there was a huge like global exposure on this, I mean, I saw you quoted in uh, the UK newspaper, The Guardian. Uh, they were, you were talking about like having to go slow in an event like this, as opposed to going flat out in a stage rally. D did you feel that global exposure while you were out there, or were you just like getting on with it? Ah, uh, no, definitely you felt it when while we were out there because we had, like you said, The Guardian, but Refinery Twenty Nine was out there as well. We worked with CNN Africa for a day. Um, and then coming back, we talked to a couple other outlets as well. Um, there was like a Playboy article as well as a couple other things. That was definitely pretty big. It didn't actually seem to bring, to forward much attention onto us, like on our social media or anything. Um, but it was a lot while we were out there, definitely. Well, well, yeah. I, w I was watching you anyway. I was checking it, I was checking it all out if nobody else was on your social media. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us were uh, yeah. that, that yeah. know our state size. I was more in reference to just um, how the all the media that we got reflected mm -hmm. back onto us, not yeah. because definitely there were a lot of people out there watching and it was great having Alex Wong out there as well to document the whole thing. The pictures are amazing and he was also able to kind of keep a little bit in touch with everyone back home which was nice he is the photog god <laughs> he is gotta love that uh and actually uh, similarly he's got a connection to something that that you're connected with which is formula one 
so you do a program that has to do with Formula One in schools. I'm guessing this has something to do with the uh, like the the STEM uh, programs we've seen that motorsports have been trying to uh, work with. Is that right? Correct. So F1 in schools is actually supported by Formula One and licensed by them. So you'll see that's why they're able to use their property. Um, but the it's a gl- basically F1 in schools. It's a global STEM challenge for students in years five to twelve, um, and the objective is to design and manufacture a small carbon dioxide power F1 style car. And they have to use computer aided design and CAM methods, like in their design and production. And aside from those aspects, they also have to build enterprise and engineering portfolios, give verbal presentations, they have to go through scrutineering, they have to build a brand for their team, have marketing, sponsorship, social media, and in the end of it all, they have to race. And it's all teams of three to six. So they're all middle Mm -hmm. and high school age students. That's a huge undertaking with all those different roles. Yeah, it's it's quite impressive, and honestly, one of our biggest things is we get these we get volunteers, which is great. But they often being so impressed by the teams, overscore them a little bit. So recently, we've had to have some talks about there's always going to be room for improvement. Reminding mm-hmm. them that mm-hmm. this is only the nationals; they still are. If you make it through, you're going to worlds, and even if it seemed perfect, you still need to improve to do well at that world's level. So, yeah, it, it is quite impressive, though. It's it's amazing. I don't know about you, Mike, but my only uh, brush with technology when I was in school was making a bookcase in woodworking class. Yeah. <laughs> I've met a lot of people that say, oh, can, can, I, do, can I do this? You know, as an adult, <laughs> it's like, <could> be... <laughs> on your own time, you could. But, yeah, it's it's really a great opportunity and honestly so many of these kids are going to be future engineers future team managers pr marketing graphic design and most of the teams that do the best at the competition actually have the students interested in the different fields so if you find a very heavy engineering team they might do really well with their car and their times and their r&d but then really fall short on the verbal and marketing and branding side so the teams with the most um, different kinds of skills are actually some of the best teams out there. But it really opens a lot of doors. Many of the kids that have done well in the competition have gone on to get placements in Randstad Williams Engineering Academy. They've gone on to work in Formula One. They've gone on to work on the Mon teams, sometimes just a couple mm-hmm. years after finishing the program. So it's, it's a really good opportunity if you're interested in going into motorsports. Wow, that is really cool. So how how many kids are usually on a on a team and how many teams are there at least uh, in the United States? Right. So this year was a little tough for us because we had to move the nationals up by a few months. Um so instead of being in June, they're February. Uh, so a lot of the teams don't really get going until December or January. So we we were a little short on teams, but the There's usually three to six kids per team. Each school is allowed to enter up to three teams. There are a lot of teams out of uh, out of Texas. Last year, the Nationals we had, I believe, 18 teams in the professional class, and then usually the top two get automatically invited uh, to the Worlds. This year, it's the top three teams going to Worlds, and then the fourth place team actually gets the opportunity to be a collaborator collaboration team so that entails that they need to work with another team in a different country that has been selected as a collaboration team as well and they have to do their project rework their branding and everything um, from the two different countries and then show up to worlds as one team and compete like that so that's actually pretty cool but very difficult so what's your role been? I know you've been a part of this program. So so what is it that you uh, specifically been trying to do with these different teams? Right. So well, we actually run two events simultaneously. So the other event that we have is the Jaguar Land Rover 4x4 in Schools Technology Challenge. And my main function is lead judge of that. So this competition, students have to build an RC car that have to perform the same as a full-scale off-road vehicle. Uh, so they kind of have similar 
tasks where they have to build a team and have the branding, marketing, portfolios, and all of that. But instead of F1 style car, they're building a four by four. And then instead of racing on the track with CO2, they actually have to drive a simulated off-road course. Um, and each team member has to drive at least one obstacle and they have a time limit in where they're able to complete the obstacles. And then each obstacle has its own scoring. So I'm the lead judge of that. But I also wind up handling usually all of the scoring documents for both events. And we always need volunteers. So honestly, most of us are filling in wherever we need on the individual event judging or doing the track official business. Um, So yeah, wearing many hats. (laughs) (laughs) As is typical for anybody that's a volunteer, but that is awesome. I, I'm an, a, a huge uh, proponent of anything with the STEM. Uh, the, was it to science, technology, engineering, and math? And um, I, I loved those subjects when I was in in high school. Yeah, a little bit better than you, Ian. I got to at least we, we made little rockets and things like that. So, <laughs> so that was a little more fun, but nothing too spectacular compared to you know like what they get to do today. Well, hats off to you for doing that. That is mm-hmm. that is just a cool cool program. And and I know we talked quite a bit about it, but. I, I just I just love the tech mixing motorsports with the school system because it's I think that's just the way that motorsports can be able to con- keep continuing on in the future. And another thing that uh, we've been hearing quite a bit about has been about just women in motorsports. And you know I I don't want to dwell too much on this because you know one thing about it I love about motorsports in general is that everything's equal. You know the it, Women, men, they can compete at the, on the same stages, the same time. It doesn't matter. Uh, but we have heard, you know, quite a bit of discussion with uh, Michelle Mouton. She's got the FIA Women in Motorsports program that she heads up. Which, what I wanted, to, I guess, kind of just bring up just a little bit is um, the different women's in motorsports initiatives and and trying to uh, get more women involved. Uh, I guess, are, are you supportive of these different programs that they have? I know there was a little bit of discussion we had on a, uh, on social media about a ladies cup, uh, which is something a lot of countries do, uh, not really here in the States. Um, but, uh, different ways to encourage women to want to get into motorsports. Yeah. So actually back when I was doing a lot of the track days and everything, we started a, women's uh, track day at Lime Rock and I think at the time none of us involved had ever seen anything like it and it actually it did a really good job of getting more women that are normally bystanders at the events um, like wives daughters friends to come out and actually give it a go didn't find that very many of them really decided, say, to go to the normal track days after that. So it's a little bit of a different, interesting thing. Like, you have to get more women involved on the ground level and get them into it all. I don't necessarily think something like the W Series, which is meant to be at, like, a professional level, is the right way to handle those funds like I'd rather see them funneled into like sponsorships and everything for women that are already doing Mm -hmm. well at that level um but for the women where it's a great opportunity like I definitely stand in their decision to go compete there um and actually like a few women have gone through didn't make the first cut and someone like Ayla Agrin who's potentially we're not going to see in a car ever again which is like a big bummer like that was her last shot to have the kind of funding that it might take to make her career so I mean I definitely want to see more programs but I'd definitely like to see it in more kinds of ground level entry like the FIA girls on track thing is a good initiative um, more sponsorship based stuff and helping women take it to the next level but yeah I definitely want to see more more women yeah so and of course the thing is, if any of these women, any women who are interested in in rally in America, I mean, they they can always come to you at an event. You're going to give them every bit every bit of good advice that you can. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and then also just going like back to the Ladies' Cup, actually we've, Rhiannon and I have definitely been, been pushing to see something like that. It's tough here because we don't have so many women competitors where it's really going to do a lot, but something like being able to say, just to a sponsor, potential sponsor, that you won the ladies' championship, that can go a long way. I think yeah. I wouldn't, if that was something that we had and for say, like we won it, but we were the only ones fully competing, that wouldn't be something that I'm going out there saying left and right. But if it came to sponsorship proposals, it would be a big, attractive point that we can make. So it's, I don't really love the idea of them in general, um, but I think that they definitely still have value. I guess for me, the analogy I was trying to make is rookie of the year, where we celebrate the points of you know rookies. It doesn't seem much different to me because the idea is there is to market, to draw attention, to bringing young new people into the sport. If the idea is to, you know, use this as a marketing tool to draw more ladies into the sport, mm -hmm. just whatever attention the cup uh, grabs. Um, whether it could be used for sponsorship, whatever. Um, to me, it sounds like the same thing as Rookie of the Year. Yeah, it's definitely very similar, but I was actually wasn't sure if we have that award currently. Do we? Um, I, I don't think we do, but I mean, I, all yeah. other forms of motorsports does, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and other forms of sport in general. Um, it's the same concept. And, you know, it, it, are people opposed to Rookie of the Year? Probably not. So mm -hmm. if the idea is just, this is just a different focus, um, yeah. I'm okay with it. But, you know, it's all about, uh, I guess, those that want to get involved and, and try and make it happen. But Yeah. I definitely think, like, as long as we're all competing on the same playing field day to day, which we are in our respective classes, that having an additional thing like a ladies' cup wouldn't take away from that. Yeah, yeah, because I mean they've been doing that in in Europe for for years. I mean, I was I did I like the history of rally, and I did a little bit of digging. And the first ladies' cup for the Monte Carlo rally was awarded back in 1928. So I mean, in Europe, such a thing as a, a ladies' cup, the Coupe de Dame, as they call it, that's been going on for for almost a hundred years. So uh, <laughs> to to uh, to come up with a with the idea um, in America where we haven't, it doesn't appear that we've like actively promoted women in motorsports for a long time. Then it does, it does seem a very strange idea, but I mean, I can remember, yeah, oh gosh, this makes me sound really old, but you know, I, I, I remember that in the, in the mid, in the mid 60s, well, I can, I can't remember, but I remember <laughs> the names from, Remember the names from the mid 1960s when you had like Pat Moss and um, people like um, uh, Rosemary Smith. I mean, th these were these were British women racing drivers who rallied with with the men alongside the men would often beat the men. But they also won the ladies cup. There was also a ladies cup for them as well. Yeah. And like, the, obviously, just a really big one right now is like the ERC's ladies cup. Mm -hmm. And it's not like there are a ton of women competing, but it's still a very good competition between the women that are there, but they're also all just still racing in their respective classes and against each other there. So it's, it's definitely a good addition. Um, something I'd like to see happen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we just all like to see the day that there's just so many women involved that, uh, we don't have to care about it, but uh, I agree that uh, it'd be nice to just increase the prominence uh, a bit more for sure. Move the conversation on here a bit to uh, ask one of our tougher questions that we like to ask on this podcast. And really, it's it's my good old blank check question, if you will. North American rallying, you know, has gone through lots of ups and downs over the years. Seems like we're on the upswing right now, but I kind of wanted to give you a chance to, I guess, voice your opinion of either what changes you'd like to see or where you'd like to see North American rallying five years from now. I, I know everybody kind of brainstorms, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, what would you like to see changed or happen in rallying in North America? Yeah. Ooh, okay. So I don't even really know where to start. There's a lot on my mind, but I'll just start by saying that with the split of the two of 
having Rally America and the American Rally Association, um, what was this now, two years ago, mm -hmm. um, it was a really interesting time. It was, on one hand, really refreshing to see a series that, like, didn't really need to answer two sponsorships or one group of people. And honestly, like, everything ran really well. And just, I think the community was like close and it was refreshing but on the other hand you didn't have the fan support which is definitely something that you also need to have um and also just you know money getting put in into the series and that's something we also obviously need to have um i would really like to see moving forward that the the series looks more like a series like right now you'll get your sub regs and you know each event because they're all individually owned, you know, has their own way of doing things. It would be really nice to have something that's just a little bit more uniform um, between the events. I'm definitely a little bit biased coming out of the road racing like world where, you know, a series owns all of its events. And I understand it's, it's definitely not as easy here in Rally when you have each event that's its own entity and you're putting them into a series. Um, but now that we're all one series again, and we have a little bit of an oversaturation of events, it'll be really interesting to see what happens moving forward, um, which events stay as nationals and which might get demoted to a super regional or regional. Um, and I think that'll all really depend on how the events run this year. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm really interested to see how it plays out. I would also just like to see a little bit more like transparency. I know a lot of concerns get brought up and no one really knows that they got brought up or is able to necessarily get put their opinion into it. So I'd like to see a little bit more like feedback from the competitors and just open discussion about some things like perhaps a ladies cup or, you know, anything like that. And not uh, under the veil of uh, social media. <laughs> I can right. see that. Yeah, yeah. Just like, and on a, just like if you have a race license for the year, that essentially that would give you a little bit of clout into the conversation versus mm -hmm. just having, you know, we have so many competitors that have competed in the past or are planning to compete, but what's really relevant is the people who are putting their time, money, and efforts into it. Those are the people that we have to know their opinions, um, but also not just having all the opinions happening kind of behind or decisions happening behind closed doors. You know, I think right. we need a little bit more competitor feedback into what's going on um, and just making sure every, all the details are available to them because I know with everything for the year coming out a little bit late because Snowdrift was the late edition, a lot of people might have registered the wrong way for Snowdrift had they had all of the details of how the scoring is going to work for the year or, you oh, know, right. just all this yeah. other stuff. So I think a lot of stuff came out late and now competitors either can change their, could change their entry type and maybe lose points because they or get stuck in what they made the decision to do without having all the details in front of them. So just... Snowdrift was the late edition. It's hard right. enough to manage that, but you know, just having things a little bit more clear and timely out to the competitors. Mm -hmm. I, I would totally agree with that. I think I think it's because it's a sport where you have so many people that are both grassroots and some people that are professional. That segregation between grassroots and professional has always been a challenge. Very very hard to try and satisfy everybody's uh, wants and desires and. Uh, but, but yeah, especially when it comes though to the uh, trying to come up with some standardization across events, I totally see that as something that that should definitely happen. Um, definitely, at least maybe just the format of how information is gathered and 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 distributed to people. Just that kind of can maybe have root books that are all done, you know, so close to the same. You're not confused. Things like that, right? Right. Yeah, just the f format. And, you know, just I think it's important that we look like a series because I think sometimes it's hard to look at it and see past some almost the individual events, if you will, or the region mm -hmm. or whatever it is like that. So just 
looking at something that if it's part of the national that you look at it and you know that it's part of the series because mm-hmm. I f- feel like we started off here with ARA with such a strong strong branding and you know that was a big part of it when it p- came up but I feel like you, when sometimes you get the individual event stuff you wouldn't like necessarily be able to say like oh it's a American Rally Association event, and that's what you want, like, the first thing to be if it's going to be mm-hmm. part of your national series. Right, right, yeah. Definitely get that congruency in there. Yeah, yeah. Every, every, it'll all it'll all fall into line eventually. I mean, this is just mm-hmm. the first, first year. You know, there's, yeah, we all, there's, we all know that there's more to a national series than putting the ARA logo on the front of the, uh, on the front of the SUPS, <laughs> you know, so, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the first year, so we can we'll just see everybody move into line. There'll be like be a little bit of give and take, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So moving on to a little bit more lighthearted stuff uh, after the the yeah. serious question, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, let's let's talk a little bit more fun. I want to know what has been your most fun or favorite moment you've had in stage rally so far. That like, you know, was there just that one stage you got to the end and you're like screaming, yeah, or something like that. <laughs> One moment that just stands out to me right now after you said that was in 2017 at STPR. Uh, the year before, we hadn't gotten to do the waste management jump because the stage was red crossed after we started it. So the next year, we get back, and I was with Cal at the time, and um, Starting out the day, it was, all right, so we're going to take this jump, but, you know, we're not going to go for big air or anything. Like, we're just we're just going to do it. And approaching the jump, we have some real speed. And so it's like, all right, you know, like, I think we're just going to go for it. She's like, okay, go for it. And so we hit the jump, and we wound up, I think, having the second biggest two-wheel drive jump of the day in the little <laughs> B-Spec Fiesta. <laughs> we're, like, getting into the first corner – uh, after the jump and you know just so much excitement in the car and then all of a sudden she's like screaming like left four left four left four <laughs> <laughs> because she like forgot to call the note because it was just like so much excitement and I think we, we got to the end of the stage and there was just so much adrenaline like I was so shaky still like miles later and um Dave Wallingford had filled up his cool shirt box with ice cream bars. <laughs> <laughs> and so he like gives me the ice cream, but I couldn't even eat it because I was shaking so bad. <laughs> that's brilliant. Oh, that's, that's a moment. That's, that's rally right there. That's, that's awesome. Gosh, I, I got, I got to love her for when she gets so excited uh, doing those notes. Oh man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sure, you saw saw the video of her and Hoop at um, LSPR oh, last Claudia's year. Oh, Claudia's a gem. <laughs> she really is. She uh, is. We love her. But you know, moving on from that though, you've uh, done also a lot more classes now. You've been uh, working with the Gelsaminos and uh, going out to Idaho, I think, right, and, and doing one of their trainings, which I think Ian's going to be doing here shortly. Yeah. yeah. So actually, um, my both of the trainings that I've done with um, out. Alex and Rian, and it's been really a couple of years, but essentially after my crash at LSPR, my, which was my first rally, um, Alex had reached out and said, you know, we run this, this pace note course, like maybe you should consider com- coming and doing it. And so in between LSPR and my first national, which was Snowdrift the next year, so the next rally, um, I'd gone out and trained with them. And then again, after my first season, we'd done a training. But obviously, both Alex and Rian and, and I all work together um, still during the rallies. So, um, you know, I'm guessing then before you were probably using the like Jemba or, or event provided notes and went on to making your own? Um, we actually still were using the Jembas. Like when we have the chance to do the two pass recce, we definitely take that and we don't use, use the Jemba. Um, but we do make a lot of modifications onto the Jemba when we have a single pass. So for instance, I do use 
five left as opposed to left five. So every time we're using like anything Jemba based, it has to get completely rewritten. Mm -hmm. gotcha. um, yeah. And then a lot of just different modifiers that we use as well. Um, Cause we really have made the notes our own, even when we are only getting to do that one pass and kind of getting stuck with the Jemba. I mean, we, we could write, but there's just, you know, a lot that you get on that second pass that it's a little bit safer for us to use the Jemba with the amount of time that we have. You know, I think there's some people that think that every event should offer two pass recce if they can. Um, I know there's some events that it's really hard to do that. I think STPR mm -hmm. has a big challenge with that. Yeah. Um, because of just the state forest they're in and the amount of time that they allow and the right. distance between the stages just makes it really hard. But yeah, I think it would personally be great if say if there, you know, we, the roads are open um, to, to traffic when we're on recce. So if we could get a optional two day, but like two day recce um, yeah. for two pass, mm -hmm. that would be great because, you know, if you can't make it, if you have to work and you can only take off the one day and, you know, a couple people out there don't even do the recce, which I, I don't like that idea, but um, anyway, you know, if we can take the time off to do it, it would be great to have the option to not get the Jemba period and just get out there a day early and then have the two passes. And by the second pass on the second day, we're going like definitely at the recce speed limit. So we're not going mm -hmm. to be, you know, slowing people down if we're riding or anything. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's that's the other thing is you end up really backing up a lot of people as you're trying to get all that stuff crammed into the one day and the one pass. I recently saw a video of you dr drifting a Subaru WRX STI in the snow. You know, um, so even though you, you, so you started with the ice racing, have, as you said, uh, so uh, do you have any thoughts of moving towards an all-wheel drive car in the near future or anything like that? Um, not quite yet. I kind of actually have an idea of what we're going to be doing for approximately the next three years, like this season and then the next two. And all-wheel drive is not in that plan quite yet. Um, but it was, it was great to get out to Eagle River and do a little bit of the private training with Patrick and also just get back to my roots of the ice driving because it, I've been finding it's it's almost easy to get just a little like sloppier and complacent in what you're doing and just drive and relying on the instincts mm -hmm. and not like during the rallies and you don't get the chance to actually just fine tune those details. So be able to go back and do that and get the feedback from Patrick. And, you know, normally if I get out to a winter driving school now, I'm sitting right seat helping, you know, today's students or you know the lakes have too much snow or they haven't frozen so it was just great to be able to go out there and really be a student and just kind of focus on the little details what was it like being out there with uh, patrick sandell because i you know i've met the guy several times now and it, he seems like just a kick in the pants just a really relaxed lot of fun <laughs> if only i could yeah. Um. <laughs> so some of this is not able to be broadcast in the podcast. Okay. No, but honestly, no. It was like great to get out there and just, you know, we're we're normally at these rallies together, and you know, everyone has their own event going on, and you have some time to real to get to chat, but most of the time, everyone's kind of doing their own thing. So it was really great to get out there and get to know each other a little bit better, and just you know found like so many similarity to, similarities to how we both are in the car and just, you know, find some things like moving, moving forward that I can really think about in my rallying. Uh, but you were mentioning a little bit about your, uh, your multi-year plan that you got going on there. So I guess that leads us kind of, as we get towards the end of the show here, talking about uh, moving forward for 2019. I think you've got uh, some exciting things coming up you were kind of mentioning to me. Obviously, starting out, uh, you're going to be out at uh, 100 Acre Wood with uh, Rhiannon sitting next to you. Is that right? Right, yes. Yeah. So, um, obviously, started out with Snowdrift, and now Rhiannon will be 
back in the car with me for 100 Acre, which was a little bit unexpected, but we're very happy about it. And, um, and then we are planning most likely to do Olympus, Ohio, Oregon, New England, Ojibwe, and then STPR. Uh, for the rest of the year, and all of those will either be with Alex or Rhiannon sitting with me. Um, But even more exciting than that, I am really excited uh, because Alex and I are going to be headed out to France to compete this year. Wow. Yeah, we're going to be campaigning a Clio R3T in select rounds of the Renault R3T trophy France. Um, it's all tarmac rallies. So it's going to be exciting um, going back to a sur- surface that I'm quite familiar with, but also mm-hmm. to be doing something totally new. And, you know, it's definitely going to be a challenge. A lot of these drivers have a lot of experience on these roads. Um, and so this year is just all about getting the new experience of driving mm-hmm. a completely new car, a completely new kind of rally, and just getting that new experience like i said wow that is super exciting so you're gonna be yeah. so the clio cup in france uh so i'm guessing that's part of the french tarmac championship but it's kind of a sub championship within that is that right correct yeah so it's um the whole thing is six rounds um we're going to be doing select rounds of that starting with charbo easter weekend um so april and then um a couple more later in the year that I'll be putting out once we've really solidified those plans, but probably around June and July. That's super cool. Now, do you have some like uh, test days kind of planned in with that as well to uh, get yourself up to speed? Uh, yeah. So the team that we'll be working with is Barcelona based. It's called ASM Motorsport. And we were referred to them through the series coordinator they also work with um, Sarah Williams um, in the same trophy. So it'll actually be pretty cool because we'll have for the rallies that I'm doing, and I think she's going to do the whole thing. So, you know, we'll have the two female drivers on the same, like working with the same team, which will be pretty cool. But yeah, so the plan is that before the first one, I'm going to be going out to Barcelona and doing a test with them before the first event, um, and Alex will actually be coming in from elsewhere, and I don't know if that's been released yet, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> they did um, announce the, uh, sorry, was it the Hoonigan guys did end up announcing the, at least mm-hmm. the, the preliminary schedule they have for the, um, for the Kazi yeah. World Tour. I think um, actually, yeah, no, it's out there. Um, he'll be coming in from New Zealand, so he'll be coming in from there, and then we'll be going into the event. Uh, but we'll be getting to play it with some different things, like sequential, with like, which I haven't worked with yet. So we'll be deciding if we want to use the paddle shifters or the sequential shift and going through all of that kind of stuff. So that'll be fun. Oh, yeah. The sequentials do make uh, quite a difference. Yeah, so that'll be pretty pretty exciting. Um like I said, just kind of getting back to the tarmac surface mm-hmm. will be really interesting as well. So definitely going to be, obviously, a faster car, faster kind of rally. So I think it'll, it'll probably be a little difficult to get up to the speed. Um, and we'll even see if we do get up to kind of the speed of the rest of the competitors by um, our last event. But it, I'm really looking forward to it. I've been kind of looking for that new challenge and this is what it's going to be <laughs> well a heck of a challenge i'm really 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 excited for you definitely yeah. that's going to be some something else yeah so then alex is actually going to come up to vermont after 100 acre and we're going to get some recce practice in as well um and actually we're also going to go out to tour de course and do the recce on that one oh wow, um, oh, wow. just to practice getting you know uh-huh some French uh, tarmac stages wrecked, and what a better one to do than mm-hmm. around the WRC. The rally of a, a, a million corners, might as well call it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That I mean, just to be there. So you're going to be there. F- so is that uh, doing the recce at the same time that the WRC event's going on? Just because I think anybody can kind of do the recce with that, right? Well, right. So we have, um, we're actually already entered um, 
to recce only. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll actually be out there with, um, I can't remember exactly how it's divided up between the P1, P2, and P3 drivers, but I think we'll be out there with the P2 and P3 or just the P3 drivers doing the recce. Um, yeah. Well, that's really cool. That's that. That's one way to definitely get some serious experience. That's awesome. Well, super excited for you. Um, 2019 is going to be a banner year for you. And you just, you know, I, I know I've been kind of watching your times and you just keep getting faster and faster and improving and improving. Uh, and yet you keep, keep expanding those horizons and adding new challenges all the time. And it, it's just been really fun to watch, uh, you, you grow with the sport and, uh, yeah, looking forward to a very exciting 2019 for you. Honestly, the, doing these trophy events, the Clio is just as obtainable for us as doing rallies here. Um, I know it seems like it's a massive undertaking, but I mean, honestly, it's about the same amount of effort. Well, I am on the East Coast, so getting to the the Pacific Northwest and getting to uh, France is about (laughs) the same distance. (laughs) But, um, you know, it's, it's a really great little program, and it's a very, like, well put together trophy and you know it's highly incentivized which our championships here aren't there's not quite as much coming back um but even without like taking into consideration the prize funds that they have just the incentives to like enter into the trophy are quite amazing um i mean we're getting tires we're getting fuel we're getting suits and the kit um for Actually, um, because I'm a female driver, nothing. Um, this wasn't even a contingency when we decided to do it. And then the 2019 regs came out and they said that they were making, instead of having like a additional um, contingency for women for the placements in the rallies, that they were going to be doing um, the trophy entry instead comped. Um, but I mean, even for anyone else it's it's less to enter into the trophy than you would pay for um suits for your driver and co-driver let alone like the fuel and tire incentive incentive i can't say the word right now incentivization (laughs) yes um it is a tongue twister so i mean it, it is really obtainable and i would you know say to anyone that you should explore what else is out there because it might seem crazy, but it's just as doable, honestly. Well, it sounds like uh, either it's the women in motorsports uh, initiatives that uh, are are run by the FIA or just France itself is really looking to incentivize getting women out there. Yeah, just Renault. Oh, it's just Renault. That's awesome. Well, that is super cool and looking to see, of course, uh, how well you do here in the States as well. Um, Definitely. Really looking forward to seeing it at 100 Acre Wood, which is going to be a huge event. Yeah. Completely capped out at 75 entries with still more hanging out there. We'll see if anybody drops and somebody else fills their spot. Um, it, it's going to be hella fun. Kiana, how does everybody follow what you're doing? Honestly, the best way, the thing I keep most up to date with is probably Instagram, but All the big stuff gets on my Facebook, makes it on my website, which you can access from Instagram or Facebook. So probably one of the two. Instagram's probably the best way. It's most simple. Uh, But yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing you at 100 Acre Wood. Ian will be there um, Mm -hmm. after doing his uh, training class with uh, Alex and Rhiannon. I know he's all stoked about that. Awesome. And uh, I'll be there as well with uh, Matt with the camera and a microphone, shove it in your face. You know how we usually do it. <laughs> <laughs> you have an awesome time, and we will see you at 100 Acre. Great. See you at 100 Acre. Yep. All right. Bye-bye. I'll see you then. See ya. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Well, we want to thank again our guest, Keon Erickson Chang, for taking the time to be with us. And we uh, have a few news bits we want to talk about before we uh, end the show. Ian, you uh, were putting something here about uh, Leanne Janilla, our good friend from the Canadian North there. Uh, She's been doing some pretty cool stuff in Paris, apparently. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking with Kiana about women in motorsport. And uh, 
And Leanne spent the week in Paris, of all places, with the uh, at, at a conference with for this uh, Women in Motorsport Commission. So she was uh, at a meeting that was chaired by Jean Tot and uh, Michel Mouton, and they were discussing women's participation in motorsports. And uh, there was some in, there was some really cool names on on the commission. I mean, Susie Wolf and um, Lena Gade are the two that uh, really jumped to my attention. So she, she's really been uh, me- meeting and working with some very important people in the uh, in the motorsport world. And so I hope everything works out for her. And uh, we do get more women taking part in, in the sport because it's a great sport and we do need more women here. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what kind of initiatives come out of uh, that mm-hmm. group and uh, you know the ideas that are shared and whatnot. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to see what comes of that. But what's really cool is to have someone that we know in rallying that mm-hmm. is the voice that's going to be part of that, right? Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, of course, having two also rallyists heading it up, Jean Todd, who's the FA head of the FIA, right? He's yeah. a former co-driver. Uh, Michelle Mouton, of course, we all know she's just like the greatest woman driver in history let alone rally driver so Mm. pretty cool stuff there uh in other news we have where ken block finally announced his kazi world tour and uh announced the livery as well first of all they do such a good job at who coming up with liveries that is a cool cool looking car oh for sure yes yeah yep it's um that's gonna look good around the world and uh, where are we where is he going is he's got nine events planned uh he's doing a hundred acre wood in a couple of weeks then he's taking it to uh new zealand, new zealand. yep Fongare. yep uh-huh Wangare, yeah and then he's bringing it to ireland to donegal Classic. and then he uh, yeah and then he's doing uh rally legend in san marino and Rally du Valais in Switzerland. Oh, nice. And That's they, an unusual it, one. Cool. Uh-huh, yeah. I think he's doing events that he's either been successful at or he's always wanted to do. So. Right, yeah. I mean, du yeah. Valais, that's one that's been on the ERC calendar, if I remember right. Yeah, so. yeah. and he's going to Festival of Speed at uh, Goodwood, which which is an event that he absolutely adores, and he's taking the, uh, the uh, Hoonigan truck as well oh, there. the Huna truck so, yes the Huna truck he's taking that there and then he's going to Jim Carner grid in Poland and he's got to work out the um logistics of a couple of other events that he, he wants to do but he's not mentioned what those are yet so uh we'll have to wait and see on that one but uh, that's going to be great I'm really excited about the uh the Wangarai thing because you know what everybody says New Zealand needs to be on the world rally circuit. And yeah. you know, if if Ken Block is there, Ken is giving a lot of attention to New Zealand. Yeah, definitely. Uh you know, he's gone there many times, uh outside of his you know, back when he was doing the WRC, he, he fell in love with the the roads there and you know, when he started, you know, doing just privateer entries, he that was a place he kept going back to and you can understand why the roads there you know i think it was him that was talking about how the car dances because of the way the mm-hmm. camber of the roads are with the crests and the dips it just yeah it's yeah. it's it's an amazing amazing area to go see um interesting also about this uh, kazi it is very different from the previous one um they explained very much uh, quite a bit of detail when they're uh, doing the release on their youtube channel this is more of what you'd call a resto mod yeah they had you know several issues with the previous one which was pretty much wrc spec from 1991 i I believe it was they're like okay you know there's things that have improved a lot since then reliability wise and things like that so they put uh more modern and more reliable parts in this version of the kazi versus the one that they had before so Mm -hmm. hopefully that will prevent uh, some of the issues like oregon trail this last year uh the first kazi they they popped a darn uh, oil filler cap going up that tarmac road, the Mary Hill Loops Road. Yeah, so it was like the first time he's going fast up it. That's great. And also in the next run up it, he's barely putting along. We're like, what's going on? Well, it turns out the thing had dumped most of its oil out, and they put I think just duct tape to cover up the where the filler cap was because you know I guess just something about you know the stresses of what they were doing with the the thing. It just popped the whole filler cap off. It's like ugh, of all the things, right? 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I believe, haven't they uh, uprated some of the aerodynamics on the bodywork as well? So that added like larger wheel arches and uh, some of the ducting around the uh, the wheels as well, haven't they? I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the pictures are all online. It, it does look like a great beast of a machine, and uh, I, I expect it to handle just as well as it looks too. So, mm-hmm. w- the the question is: is will this be his? Was he's one hundred acre woods seven times? Can he make mm-hmm. it an eighth? Will this be a car that can challenge Higgins and Drew and uh, young Oliver Solberg? Mm, who knows? Yeah, it's it's going to be quite the event, and we're we're going we're going we're to be lucky to be there. Of course, you'll see more of it than I will because I'll be so far at the back. I'll be like more seventy-five minutes behind um, behind them when they're finished. Oh, yeah, here's here's a funny story for you. I actually when when I'm when I'm co-driving. Yeah, if before an event, I always have a bad dream. And if I have the bad dream, that means everything is going to go right during the event. So I'm having this dream about a 100 acre wood. And in it, I'm sat on the sat at the start line of one of the stages. And you call me on my cell phone. I call you? You call me on my cell phone and you say, Ian, Ken Block will give us an interview. But you've got to get here in 10 minutes. And here I am like about half an hour from Park Ferme. So I just turned to Scott and I said, nail it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I've had my dream about 100 Acre Wood. So everything's going to go great on 100 Acre Wood for us. All right. Well, I'm looking forward <laughs> to seeing that. Uh, I think the conditions will probably be a little less slick or hope so than mm. uh, what you guys had up uh, when you're, well, last uh, driving together in the... Uh, uh, that was Nimaji. Nimaji. That was That's what I meant. Nimaji sheet ice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Right. Well, apologies for the background noise. That would be our cat that decided to, uh, Lulu decided to make a little bit of an interruption. Be nice, Lulu. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, so, uh, other story we want to talk about is um, you were telling us last week, uh, or was it two weeks ago now? Gosh, we've been so busy. So many of these podcasts. Um, Sarah McFadden, she's the Sarah one McFadden. that is the... Uh, the visually, visually, visually impaired. impaired. That's the term I wanted to yeah. use, exactly. So, yes, yeah. so um, she had her first rally of the season. The uh, which was the I think it's the Burr Motor Club Abbey Leaks Hotel Stages Rally, and after that event, they are currently running third in class in the Triton Showers National Rally Championship and 16th overall. So a good start to the season for her there, her and her dad. So uh, we'll, I'll be following following what they do uh, with great interest. Awesome, yeah. awesome and stuff. The thing was with with her weekend was she was that uh, they uh, did uh, like recce and scrutineering on the Saturday a Saturday afternoon. Then she went to a ball somewhere to receive a, another Person of the Year award from somebody, and then came back and did the rally on the Sunday. So yeah. Well, so uh, let, let's let, let's stick with the overcoming adversity uh, theme here because I saw a post today where. Um, our good friend, Savage Dave Wallingford, mm-hmm. had just graduated, as he called it, uh, from occupational therapy. He no, he can obviously just going to be doing stuff on his own now, but uh, all the physical therapy stuff that he's had to do that was regimented, he's free and clear to do whatever he needs to do on his own. And that Absolutely. is just a great, great story there. He's going to be in the R5 at 100 Acre Wood. Just wow. Yeah. <laughs> After what happened a year ago, and to have him back in the car... Another inspiration right there. Mm-hmm. Yep. We're so excited to to see him back in a car, especially especially in the Fiesta. So that's, uh, yep, that's another thing to look forward to about 100 Acre Wood. It's just going to be, it's just what a great, great weekend it's going to be. It seems like everyone's going to descend yep. on Missouri in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome, awesome. Um, and then talking about uh, stuff a little bit farther up north, where we hopefully get more international people descending. Yep, uh, there are uh, new developments in the uh, WRC Canada uh, um, plans. They posted on uh, social media this morning that uh, there could be a candidate event for for this for this rally as soon as 2022. They wanted to put it on in 2023, but the FIA said that they would rather see it in 2022. 
I believe. So that's so, good. So like... they want to have the candidate event by 2022 with the actual WRC event in 2023 now? Well, well, the candidate event will dictate whether they have a uh, right. WRC event. Usually but, uh... it's one year before, though. So, yeah, so... wow. That uh, accelerates their schedule a wee bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's very exciting news. Uh, the thought that uh, in a few years, the cream of the world's rally crop could be just over the border from Minnesota. You know, it's it's fantastic. So, well, I was I trying just, to... you got my I've got my passport now. So, you know, <laughs> things could you're, happen. You're good. You can be the voice of Canadian rally as well. I don't speak French. <laughs> but i will happily go along and visit and uh and try and absorb all the action for sure all right oh, yeah. so in other news uh you, you put in some hollywood blockbuster stuff well yeah this is this is this is a great piece that i, I found this morning uh michael fassbender that's the he's uh for those of you who aren't up on your movies he was he was Oscar nominated in the movie uh, 12 Years a Slave, and he's appeared in the X-Men movies and Steve Jobs movie. He is going to be competing in the uh, Rally of the Lakes, which is uh, organized by the Killarney and District Motor Club over in Ireland there. So... Um... I like him even more now. <laughs> Cause I, uh -huh. I like Michael yeah. Fassbender as an actor already, but uh, the fact that he's going to be taking on rallying, yes! Mm. Yeah, cool. well, I mean, he's he is he was he he was born in the area. I think that's why he's uh, that's why he's taking a, taking part in it. And uh, yeah, because he everybody, I think we all know he's uh, he's a keen motorhead. He's taken part in the North American Ferrari Challenge series, so uh, he's no stranger to handling a car at speed. So uh, that's going to be that's going to be quite. That's always it's always nice to know when there are famous people in your sports so uh, we will wish him good luck on that one and uh we will look for results and see how he does well and and thinking of this you know th think a bit longer term you know he's if he's mostly ra been racing ferraris in the states but then he's going to go over to ireland to do a rally so then the rally is going to be in his blood how about doing mm -hmm. some rally in the states i'm just saying yeah um, yeah well it's fairly reasonable <laughs> isn't it yeah <laughs> We know a co-driver. <laughs> right, right. I, I know somebody. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, I think that about wraps up this show. And as always, remember, you can get our podcast here on Podbean, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or search your favorite podcast app. We're also on all the popular social media platforms, Facebook. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well, uh, where we publish these. No real moving video, because I don't think you want to see my face with headphones on. It looks kind of dorky. So, um, But uh, you can listen to them, do them there. Uh, please make sure you subscribe, tell a friend, give us a like and a share. That always does help us out. I'm your host, Mike Shaw, for Ian Holmes. Thanks for listening, and keep it shiny side up. Thank <laughs> you.